The calming sound of crashing waves, the idyllic sights of turquoise ocean, and the thirst-quenching taste of a pina colada. These are a few things that perfectly describe a tropical holiday. But when Irish couple John and Michaela Macarivi travelled to Mauritius to celebrate their wedding, neither had expected the honeymoon to turn into a nightmare. And in fact, one of them would never return home. The tragic events of this case were perpetuated by fame, corruption, and a poorly handled investigation. But who ultimately was to blame for the events which took place? And what were the dramatic consequences? When jetting off to places far away, we all tend to have fun and take marginal risks. But in Michaela's case, her time in paradise was as safe as one could be. So, what evil found her? And how did it all go so terribly wrong? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the perplexing case of Michaela Macarivi. A general disclaimer to those who don't like unsolved cases, but this one is still to be fully understood. So please take this as your one and only warning. And by the way, I post true crime and strange cases here on a weekly basis, so if that does sound like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to the channel. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Michaela Macarivi. Bonjour, folks. Today, we find ourselves in a new location on the Coffeehouse crime map, and that is the fascinating East African island of Mauritius. And let me tell you, when it comes to tropical paradises, you will be challenged to find a more fitting place. Located off Africa's eastern coastline, but part of the Indian Ocean, Mauritius is home to fantastic weather throughout the entire year. Regardless of the month, the average temperature always remains between 26 and 21 degrees Celsius, which for you Americans out there is between 80 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And to add to all of this, you're nearly always guaranteed to have at least 7 hours of sunshine every single day. The island nation is well known for its silky platinum beaches, turquoise waters, and countless countless reefs in the ocean, all of which are teeming with vivid marine wildlife. Taking a step away from the coastline, you will find the famous Black River Gorges National Park, a park that is packed with rainforests, breathtaking waterfalls, more than 40 miles of hiking trails, and of course, the unique creature, the flying fox. And by the way, did you know that Mauritius has an underwater waterfall? Well, okay, it may not technically be what it looks like. But from the sky, this spectacular sight seems to literally defy the laws of physics. This is caused by the beach's sands being forced off the plateau by oceanic currents, creating the illusion of water falling off a seabed's ledge. In this beautiful country, most of the residents speak Mauritian Creole, a deviation of the French language. And after that, the traditional French and English languages are nationally understood too. Despite its small island size, more than 1.5 2 million people call this place home. And with an abundance of unique natural beauty and culture, it is obvious to see why too. Mauritius depends on its financial services, textiles and sugar exports, and, rather unsurprisingly, tourism to keep it afloat. And one of those taking a holiday on the island in 2011 was 27-year-old Michaela Macarivi. Born on December the 31st, 1983, to her mother and father, Marianne and Mickey Hart, Michaela was brought into a locally famous family. Her father, Mickey Hart, was the manager of the Tyrone Gaelic football team. Now, I'm not going to pretend I know much about Gaelic football. We might have to ask Mike for that one. But in basic terms, it's a variant of Irish football consisting of 15 players per team. It's quite similar to rugby and AFL, except the ball is round. And honestly, to me, it looks like a rather strange mix-up between soccer and Australian football. Although this story took place in 2011, Mickey would manage Tyrone football team for 18 long years. He is also known as the most successful senior manager in the country's history, so it is rather safe to say that he did a pretty good job. As for Michaela herself, she attended St. Malachi's Primary School, and would later graduate with a bachelor's degree in education. With a father so heavily invested in the sport, football became the dominant topic in the family household. Mickey lived and breathed football, and soon enough, Michaela would too. She ended up being heavily invested in the sport, and as a result, grew a close bond with her father. 
However, loving football didn't make Michaela a tomboy. In fact, she was quite the opposite. Seen as conventionally feminine, she won several beauty pageants throughout her 20s. And with her close connection to her father's successful career, she became a micro-celebrity in her very own right, often appearing on TV shows and even interviews. Will you welcome, please, the All-Ireland Willing Manager, Mickey Hart, and his daughter, Michaela. We'll put Sam down gently. Congratulations, Thank Mickey you. and Thank Michaela. You. Congratulations to you, because I know you've been there every step of the way. That's right. I Isn't Sam have. looking great? He's looking very well tonight, very shiny. I think he got, got a, a bit of a clean-up for the I think he got the refurbished, final. didn't he, for the, right. for the final. Have you got a man in your life at the moment? I do. I, I do indeed. Is he interested in football He's as much as you are? He's definitely interested in football. He would, he would have to be now to be any man of mine. Yeah, does he play? <laughs> he does play, but I'm not going to say any more now because I get in trouble when I go back. Yeah, he doesn't play for Tyrone then, is Not it? Tyrone, no. Ooh. Went a bit further afield. Did you? Uh, still north of the still border? In the, still in the north of the country, yeah. All right, so, it, but it's not likely that they'll end up meeting Tyrone. <laughs> well, that's a tough one now, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, he's from County Down, yeah. and we met, we end up um, meeting each other, the two counties this year. So there's a wee bit of tension for a period, but... Divided loyalties that's in the it. heart that household. There's only one team for me. All right. <laughs> no, well, no look, divided loyalties for Michaela. <laughs> can I say congratulations once again to, to you, Mickey, and Michaela. You were as much part of it, I think, all the way along. Thank and thanks much. very much for bringing Sam in to say hello. You're very welcome. Congratulations. Alluding to finding love in that interview, Michaela eventually married a man named John McAreevy. John was an accountant, a Gaelic football player, and the captain of his club, Tullyish. They seemed like a very well-matched couple, and their story was one of traditionally modern success. To add to her own string of achievements, Michaela would also go on to become a finalist in Ireland's Rose of Tralee beauty pageant, where participants are not necessarily judged on their appearances, but on their personality and suitability to serve as ambassadors. Things eventually became very serious between the two, and eventually, on December the 30th, 2010, just one day before her 27th birthday, John and Michaela officially married in a small church in Tyrone. It was clear to see that the couple were madly in love with one another, and friends described their bond as unimaginably strong. You could even argue that, when together, the two were seen as a power couple. Where John was a football player who knew his way around the football pitch and a spreadsheet, Michaela was a teacher who also won several beauty pageants. As with most marriages, most newlyweds like to go on a honeymoon, and with its warm weather and idyllic scenery, it is no surprise that Michaela and John chose Mauritius. In fact, Mauritius had become somewhat of a hotspot for the Irish, and the hotel they were staying in, the Legends Hotel, was particularly sought after. Situated on a beach in northern Mauritius, Legends was a five-star luxury resort featuring a swimming pool looking over the Indian Ocean. Surrounded by rock pools, palm trees, forests, and beaches, it is clear to see why so many love this place too. I mean, the accommodation was pretty awesome too. Honestly, I wouldn't have said no to a place like this for a holiday. The newlywed couple touched down in Mauritius on January the 8th, 2011, where they then made their way to the idyllic resort, which was located near the northern tip of the island. After arriving, John tested his luck by asking the concierge for a better room, and to his surprise, the hotel gave him and his wife an upgraded room to stay in. As well as being more opulent, this room was also closer to the restaurant and the beach. On January the 9th, 2011, a surveillance camera captured the both of them booking themselves into a couple of spa treatments. Michaela and John were ready to enjoy the holiday together, celebrating their love and commitment for a lifetime. However, not even in their wildest nightmares, Neither of them would ever imagine that this supposed lifetime would only last for 24 more hours. The date was January the 10th, 2011. It was a Monday, and the island nation of Mauritius was enjoying 29 degrees Celsius weather, 84 Fahrenheit. Michaela and John were settling into the third day of the honeymoon. John was given a free golf lesson as part of the hotel package, and while on his class, Michaela waited for him by the poolside. The newlywed couple reconvened shortly after noon, heading for lunch at one of the resort's restaurants named the Banyan Pool Bar and Grill. After finishing up, they planned to have tea together before getting on with the rest of their day. Now, perhaps it's the British part of me coming out here, 
but everyone loves something sweet alongside their tea. Rather conveniently, the couple had received a box of chocolates as part of their welcome package. And since their room was very close to the restaurant, Michaela decided to go back and grab them to have alongside her warm drink. However, as the minutes ticked by, John began to worry. Michaela said that she would be right back, but half an hour had passed and there was still no sign of her. By 1.10pm, he had become concerned enough. He collected his receipt and then made his way back to the hotel room. Knocking on his hotel room, 1025 elicited no response. Nobody appeared to be in, however he could hear the faint sound of water through the door. And to make things more complicated, he had forgotten his room key at the swimming pool. After looking around and having no luck finding it, he headed back to the hotel's reception to ask for a new one. The hotel staff handed him a replacement card, before one of them kindly escorted him back to his room. However, something immediately felt off when he got back to room 1025. After using the new keycard and opening the door, the sound of water increased in volume. And after peering in, John was faced with the worst possible of circumstances. Michaela's lifeless body could be seen floating in the bathtub. What happened next was very messy and would hinder the investigation permanently. It took officers more than half an hour to arrive, and a further one hour to cordon off the crime scene. During this time frame, dozens of people walked in and out of the hotel room, and this included staff, doctors, and even random guests just walking by. To add to the long list of mistakes already made, Michaela's body had also been moved from the bathroom into the hallway. Anyway, although John was initially considered to be a suspect, he was eventually ruled out, and within 24 hours, three staff workers had been arrested. Their names were Avanash Tribuun, Sandeep Munia, and Raj Tikoi. Why exactly they were arrested, we'll get to in just a moment. However, they wouldn't be the only ones to be under the spotlight. So, after months of piecing the evidence together, what did investigators believe happened to Michaela? It is believed that, at 2.42pm, someone with access entered through the front door. This was proven through the keycard surveillance program, which highlighted that GMK5, a magnetic keycard for room service supervisor 2, had entered. It is believed that someone had entered the room to steal whatever they could find. And one piece of evidence which could support that theory is a fingerprint which would later be found on the door leading to the safe. To the thief's surprise, Michaela entered the room only two minutes later at 2.44pm, and likely startled, the thief then tried to hide. Now, if the killer were a cleaner, then they would have had the ultimate excuse to be there, so it's widely speculated that whoever was in the room was either a janitor or a security guard. The killer or killers decided to hide in the bathroom in hopes that she wouldn't enter. Sadly though, she did and when that happened, they decided to change tactics by immobilizing her instead. It's at this point in time that they tackled her from behind, and tragically strangled her to death. After this, Michaela's body was placed in the bathtub and the water was turned on, and although it's not clear why, this was likely a foolish attempt to make it look like she had drowned. And, as we already know, at 3.26pm, John entered the hotel room to find his wife's lifeless body. Those initially suspected of the crime were Avanash Trabuun, a 32-year-old cleaner working at the hotel, and Sandeep Munia, his 42-year-old supervisor. Raj Tikoi, who was 33 years old at the time, was also a cleaner at the resort. With much attention on the use of magnetic keycards, it was learned that all three men had been using them to gain unlawful access to the guest rooms. It was further learned that all three of them had been stealing from guests, which put them under a great deal of suspicion when it came to Michaela's death. As a result, Avanash and Sandeep were therefore charged with murder, whereas Raj was charged with conspiracy to murder. Now, at first, it seemed like a relatively open and shut case. Avanash would even confess the following day. However, this confession would later be retracted for multiple concerning reasons. And trust me, this was only the beginning of a long and messy investigation. One week after Michaela's murder, another two suspects were arrested under similar charges of aiding and abetting a crime. And these two were 26-year-old Dasen Narayanan and 39-year-old Sinarain Mungu. Now, Dasen is a rather peculiar suspect. Despite being hired as a security guard at the hotel, he now faced charges that accused him of quite the opposite. And to add to his charges, forensic analysis determined that his DNA was found on the door of the hotel room's safe. 
But you see, this is where it gets quite complicated. Those who were at the crime scene before it was cordoned off were able to confirm that Destin had entered the apartment to offer assistance after the initial discovery of Michaela's body. So his DNA being present was no longer enough to confirm or deny his involvement in the murder itself. Sinarain Mungu was another security guard at the resort, and was thought to be involved. This was because the investigators initially believed that his card was the one actually used to enter the room. It was also believed that these five men may have been part of an organised theft ring, working together to gain access to guest rooms, steal their belongings, provide an additional set of eyes, and then split the profits. Without any sufficient evidence, investigators were forced to drop all murder charges against Dasen and Sinarain. Raj Tikoi was also in the clear too, but only under one condition. He would have to testify in court against Avinash and Sandeep. Moving to the legal proceedings of this case, it would take 16 months for the two remaining suspects, Avinash and Sandeep, to be put on trial. This is a very distressing time for both our families. And the days ahead will be very difficult for us. We hope that the media will understand that we are anxious, that nothing will be said or done that will compromise or prejudice due process during the trial. We appreciate the interest and support of many media outlets over the past year, but we hope that whilst here in Mauritius, the media will recognise and accept our need for space and privacy for the duration of the trial. We want to make it clear that we will be not making any statements before the end of the trial, nor will we be taking any questions in order to respect the court proceedings. Thank you for your support and we ask for your prayers at this time. The major crime investigation team faced severe criticism for its handling of this case. It was revealed that, although Avinash had confessed to murdering Michaela, this was only after allegedly being beaten by officers for three long days. DNA tests, which were conducted by forensic experts, concluded that no DNA traces of four of the men were present on the body or at the crime scene. This of course excluded Dasen, whose DNA was confirmed to be on the door, but verified to occur through supporting John after Michaela's discovery. And so, with no hard DNA evidence whatsoever, how could anyone be found guilty? Now, the defense would still pull a few wild cards in their case. They argued this surveillance clip, which was conveniently leaked to the press one day before being used in the trial, captured John and Michaela arguing at the reception desk. If these two were in fact John and Michaela, then it would have obliterated the case. However, it was clearly captured around 15 minutes after she had been murdered, and was therefore a clear distraction set by the defence. As you can likely imagine, prosecutors were having none of it. An assistant commissioner of the police confirmed that this video was footage of two separate guests from Germany, and so the footage was eventually dismissed by the court. The defence team would heavily lean on blaming John for his wife's murder, despite this not making any technical sense whatsoever. Surveillance cameras and witnesses had him accounted for the entire time. The defence would also drag Michaela's name through the mud, suggesting that perhaps she had died from a sexual fantasy with a stranger gone wrong. After being cleared of his involvement, Raj Tikoi would eventually take to the stand in their trial where, as mentioned before, he was offered full immunity if he promised to speak the truth by testifying against Avinash and Sandeep. Raj claimed that at around 2.45pm, which was before Michaela's death, he saw a cleaning trolley with Avinash's name outside room 1025. Just as he was walking away from the trolley, he heard a woman screaming out in pain, which prompted him to run and hide nearby in room 1021. After that, he claimed that he saw Avinash and Sandeep walking away from room 1025 looking rather worried and disgruntled, and when he confronted them, they threatened him with his life should he say anything to anyone. As you can likely imagine, this case was a very pivotal moment for Mauritius. Like many of my videos on Thailand, and as with all countries that heavily depend on tourism, there is a strong desire to make sure that all tourists feel safe on their holiday. So, safe to say, the last thing that they wanted was to have a killer roaming free on the streets. Everyone felt this pressure in Mauritius, from the hotel staff who now had to work extra hard to earn the trust of their guests, 
right up to the president, who made fresh calls to reinstate the death penalty. The defense were up against some very big figures too, so they had to use very heavy tactics to their advantage. They highlighted and criticized Mauritius's corrupt police force, and further claimed that they had selected two poor workers as scapegoats to rid the country of an unsolved murder. Now, unfortunately, there is some level of truth behind these claims too. The police force in Mauritius is often criticized for beating confessions out of potential suspects, so it's technically not too far of a reach for Avanash to have been forced into making one. To add to this, the police had also failed to conduct basic diligence. They had failed to secure the crime scene swiftly, failed to take fingerprints from an allegedly stolen wallet, and even failed to find any DNA at the scene. Tension inside the courtroom grew to a peak around Avanash's confession. With no DNA or concrete evidence available, his own written confession was probably the most damning article at hand. However, with allegations of police brutality in a force that is well known to practice it, no one could be sure whether or not it was a natural confession or one that was forced out of him. On one hand, Avanash was medically examined and noted to have no injury all three times he was supervised. But on the other hand, his recount of events sounded too accurate to be fabricated. Although this case was initially planned to be wrapped up within two weeks, it would actually take almost two months for the jury to reach a verdict. However, after only two hours of deliberation, they unanimously came to their decision. Avanash Tribuwun and Sandeep Munia were officially found to be not guilty of the murder of Michaela Makarivi. As a result, they were officially free and released from the courtroom. As you can likely guess with such a verdict, Michaela's family were devastated by the news and after seven long weeks at trial, they felt no justice had been served. John and the Hart family were certain that Sandeep and Avanash were in fact the real killers too, and so this verdict came with great frustration. Many changes were made in the aftermath of this trial too, with one of those most notable being a change to the country's own laws. Now, suspects could be retrialed for the same crime. These law changes were a direct result of Michaela's case, so it is clear to see that both the authorities and the government were unhappy with the jury's verdict. John gave an emotional statement after the trial, saying that no matter what, he would always fight for justice for his wife, even if it took him 20 years longer. However, sadly, months of no breakthrough would eventually turn into years, and still to this day, no one has been found guilty. Now, that's not to say there hasn't been some progress. Some of it good, and some of it bad. Following repeated calls for the trial to be reopened, Michaela's case has been reopened and closed again several times, with most recent investigations starting in June 2021 and are still in review to this day. But unfortunately, just as this case was beginning to pick up speed, Raj Tikoy allegedly took his own life. He was found hanging a short journey from his home. People do wonder if foul play was involved, especially since he was the only key witness to a case that is once again building momentum. And even now, police are still actively reviewing his case. In March 2022, Dasan Narayan, who was one of the original five suspects, was rearrested on new allegations of conspiracy to commit theft. Moving back to the day that Michaela was murdered, security room key GMK5 was used to gain access to her room only two minutes before she had returned. It turns out that GMK5 was a key specifically used by security, and on the morning that she had been murdered, this keycard had been swapped with a dummy keycard. The dummy keycard was checked for fingerprints, and the results confirmed that Dasan's DNA was found on it. Now, Dasan's excuse is that he gave GMK5 to Sandy. He later claimed that police had tortured him into giving this statement. And, rather suspiciously, all of his charges were then suddenly dropped. To make things even more strange, he was never even used as a witness in court. Sandeep Munia has also been arrested in 2022 under fresh charges of stealing a magnetic keycard. With these new arrests, it is almost certain that both men were part of an underground thief operation at the Legends Hotel at the time of Michaela's death. Now, if Michaela's death seemed to be prompted by her unexpectedly walking in on an intruder, then these dots suddenly begin to connect themselves. But whether any breakthrough will actually come to light, or if Michaela will ever receive the justice she deserves, is yet to be seen. The fact that, more than 10 years later, no one has been brought to justice for this dreadful crime only serves to compound the grief and pain endured by Michaela's family. 
Michaela was a unique and diverse young woman. She managed to bring glamour and poise to a sporting world often seen as masculine. She worked hard throughout her life, had a profound impact on her family and friends, and was loved by many beyond, both sporting fans and admirers alike. Not only was she gifted and down to earth, but she was a wonderful loving wife and an adored daughter. The world was robbed of a bright spark when she was taken all too soon, on what should have been one of the happiest moments of her life. Michaela's funeral was eventually held in the same church she was married in only three weeks prior, and a hall that had recently been filled with joy and happiness was now filled with pain, confusion, and sorrow. We're giving people this chance to, to, to say, look, at, this is how we feel. Many people have felt like this in the past. This is our day to bear this cross. Uh, we just love our Michaela. She was such a good girl. And, you know, every father does say that about their daughter, but I can say that without a shadow of a doubt. She was a gem, and we'd always remember her. And what a day she had on her wedding day. She was just radiant, beautiful girl. And I just love her to bits, and so does our whole family. And, and we just are so devastated. A few side notes to mention in this case, but following the verdict, some of the Irish community initiated a boycott against visiting Mauritius, and this protest was even backed by Irish politician Sean Kelly. Now, this is a difficult option to consider. While I do understand the pain and anguish that Michaela's family and friends must feel, I don't think a single murder should deter millions of people from visiting the island, nor do I think it would be fair for so many innocent workers to lose their livelihood. This is not to say that no action is required, however. It is clear to see that various levels of corruption ran through this case, with a staggering amount of incompetence to go alongside it. And even still, to this day, police corruption makes newspaper headlines on a monthly basis. Speaking of headlines, in July 2012, a Mauritian newspaper called the Sunday Times published photographs of the crime scene, which even included images of Michaela's body under the headline exclusive. In light of this news, police officers raided the offices of the newspaper the very next morning, but rather conveniently found none of the photographs in question. And even to this day, nobody knows who published them or how. In November 2015, and with the blessing of the Hart family, John remarried to a woman named Tara Brennan. To this day, he still fights for justice for Michaela, and Tara has been an important part of his own internal healing. I sincerely hope that the two are happy, and are able to live a fulfilling life. After Michaela's murder, the Legends Hotel has since changed its name to the Lux Grand Gaub in an effort to distance itself from the awful crime which took place there. They have also renumbered the room in which Michaela was murdered, simply changing it from room 1025 to room 1026. All subsequent rooms have been renumbered, and 1025 no longer exists. So, if you do find yourself staying at the Lux Grand Gaub, please be wary of your hotel room. You may just end up staying in the very one where an incredible young woman was murdered. Personally speaking, I'm not too sure what to think about changing room numbers, because if it were me, I would have closed that room off forever. It is very clear to see that there was a great deal of corruption throughout this case, which unfortunately is probably why it's still unsolved to this day. I hope that moving forward, we will eventually find her killer, or killers. So, what do you think about this case? Do you think that Avinash and Sandeep murdered Michaela? Or do you think it was someone else? Because honestly, I am not too sure what to think here, as there seems to be so many avenues and possibilities. Anyway folks, I think I'm going to wrap this case up here today. So once again, thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or insightful, remember to like the video or subscribe if you haven't yet, it really does help me out. By the way, if you'd like to get early access to my videos, exclusive content, and much much more, please head on over to my Patreon. And if you'd like to see more about me, more about my cat Nero, and more about my adventures and true crime, then please follow my social media profiles. I'll leave the links to all of that down below. Anyway folks, thank you again so much for watching, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another video. Until that moment arrives though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.